I want to welcome you to the week three live meeting in business law. And we have to cover a lot of material this afternoon. We have three chapters in, um, in this week. And so I may move a little quicker than, um, I normally do in, um, trying, making sure that we get all of the information in. And if you notice from the, um, Chapter heading, two very important issues today, privacy and how technology affects privacy. Now, we have to understand the law in our Bill of Rights has a provision that prevents the government from entering into our um, private life um, unless there is some reasonable rela relationship and some probable cause to do that. And as part of that privacy that we all expect, the an interesting sidelight, there is no provision in our Constitution for privacy. The concept of us having our lives protected, our private lives, is developed by the Supreme Court who decided cases involving an invasion of privacy and kind of included that in the wording of the Constitution. There's no actual amendment that covers privacy uh, to the extent that we would expect. And the authors in chapter three has, have given you a couple of cases here to kind of show how companies now are trying to control their employees. And I'm sure if you've worked for a large company, you know exactly what I mean as to what they are going to protect and what they want to find out about you as their employee. And the first case, Michael A. Smith versus the Pillsbury Company, sets up the situation where Mr. Smith had been having email conversations between himself and his boss. And because of these conversations, they, the in the case, they don't give us what actually was involved with these conversations, the um, company terminated. Mr. Smith, feeling that he was wrongfully discharged, sued the Pillsbury Company, claiming what I explained earlier, that this was an invasion of his privacy for the company to be monitoring his emails and that that should have been he should have had the expectation of privacy when he was making these email conversations. The court rejected Mr. Smith's argument that there was no expectation of privacy on his part. The company had a legal right to monitor the company email and um, he had no cause of action. They dismissed his case. And I think we probably would understand that this is the situation now that most companies are monitoring the email. And so it's probably a good idea not to put anything on there that you feel would be embarrassing or um, something that you don't want somebody else to read. And um, we can just assume that your company is reading your email. Now, the author points out on page 73 an interesting fact that by 2003, 
92% of employers were conduct conducting some form of electronic monitoring, 92%. 26% of the companies have terminated employees for misuse of the internet, 25% for email misuse. Email seems to be a special case because one in five employees, employers has had email subpoenaed in recent years and 13% have in, been involved in lawsuits triggered by email. So this is an important issue today. And of course, again, it's new technology that years ago before the internet, we wouldn't even be talking about this, but it shows that as technology changes, our legal system has to keep up with it and change along with um, the technology. Now the authors also have a good discussion in the chapter, I'd recommend this to you, involving the functions of privacy and really how did it develop? What are the basis for the law protecting your, your privacy? Another issue related to the monitoring of email is many companies today are starting to have rules regarding the, the lifestyle choices of their employees. And many are probably stricter than others, but this is another new area where the employer is wanting to monitor what the employee does outside of work. And that's a controversial issue. Is that really something that the employer should be involved in. <laughs> now, the um, case in the book is the state of New York versus guess who, Walmart. And the case is kind of interesting um, it, in how it really goes to how it ends up in a lawsuit. A married employee of Walmart who was separated from her husband started dating another employee at Walmart. Walmart discovered that these two individuals were dating and they fired them, claiming that the two employees had violated Walmart's fraternization policy as to the interaction with between employees. The, the, the interesting part of the case was that this, the court was having to interpret a statute that New York, the state of New York, this is where the case was. The state of New York had a statute which said that there were certain kinds of activities that should not be prevented by employers. Certain recreational activities were, should not be limited by employers in the state. The court subsequently decided that dating was not part of recreational activity, that Walmart was within their rights to terminate these employees for dating each other. And um, the court dismissed the employee's lawsuit. So kind of an interesting result. And again, showing companies trying to control the lifestyle of, the, uh, of their employees. Now, Carriker versus Renna Center takes a little different approach. Character involved certain management candidates, individuals who were employees of Renna Center, who wanted to be managers. And as part of the requirement to be made a manager of Renna Center, you had to take a series of tests. And I'm sure some involved how to manage people, some of the policies of Renna Center, and fact and situations like that. But also part of this test was a psychological test. And 
Renna Center was doing this to determine whether these individuals were had some kind of psychological problems or they well adjusted. Well, the employees, of course, objected to this. They sued Renna Center based on the fact that their privacy had been invaded and that using psychological testing was an invasion of their privacy. The court rejected this argument and dismissed their case and argued that a company has the right to do psychological testing of its employees. And so you can see how the, the how this has ex been extended in recent times. Timothy versus Chase Manhattan Bank is a little different because in this case, the, um, the plaintiffs were a group, were a large group of customers who were suing Chase Manhattan Bank because they had discovered that Chase had sold some of their personal information to third party vendors. And I'm sure you're familiar with this. The bank would send, would give the customer's information to financial planners or someone who would contact the customers of Chase and try to solicit their business. And again, the customers based it, this their argument in their lawsuit that this was an invasion of their privacy, that the bank had no right to sell this information to third parties. And again, the court upheld the tactic of Chase Manhattan Bank that how the customer's privacy had not been violated and therefore their the the rights they had no privacy rights involving their information and if um probably since this case you may have gotten statements from banks and other companies that you have have credit with and they will set out their requirements as to what they will and will not provide third parties and many of them will disclose exactly what they are providing to um, to these third parties. The, um, the last case in chapter three is again an argument made by an individual that her privacy was being violated. And Ms. Lanier, I believe, was going to be hired as a librarian for the city of Woodburn. And as part of the hiring process, the city of Woodburn required a drug test for all new employees. And Ms. Ms. Lanier objected to this, that again, the argument being it violated her right to privacy, that she, her, she was being tested for drugs without any indication that she was a drug user. The um, court again held that the um, the city was within its rights, that there, the city could test new employees for drugs, and um, this is pretty much the law in the United States that companies are free to test potential employees and, and current employees as to uh, their potential drug use. The, um, the last case, and it's not in the, um, the PowerPoint I want to mention, is interesting from this standpoint, and it's the Berkeley laboratory test, laboratory case. And what's interesting about this case was, and you can see the difference and probably why the authors included this in the text, black employees discovered and Berkeley Laboratories does many kinds of um, product development and they have to 
and they want to be sure about the health of their employees. And so they were doing tests to um, determine did the employees have any health problems that would hinder their the, the work they were doing. The problem was the black employees discovered that they were being tested for sickle cell anemia that is prevent that is almost always a a illness that affects the black population and they sued the um, laboratory and they won based on the fact that under the constitution as we've talked about the company cannot discriminate based on race and the court held that the testing of black employees for sickle cell anemia was a violation of the constitutional protection and um, the plaintiffs were able to prevail on that basis. Now, chapter five, of course, is another important issue involving the workplace and em employees, the health and safety of employees while they're on the workplace. And the, the law is very concerned about employees being protected for any kind of injuries that they can suffer. Now, the, the first case, the Lombardi versus Whitman case is based on the fact that after the 9-11 attacks and the collapse of the two towers of the World Trade Center, there was, of course, a tremendous, there was tremendous damage. We're all familiar with the, the videos of, of what occurred. And as part of the cleanup, employees who were doing the cleanup work were subject to contracting various illnesses that the environment there involving the building materials can result in, in the employees being expo exposed to certain harmful products. The employees had an interesting argument when they filed their suit. They claimed that the EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency, the federal agency that regulates the environment, had deliberately made statements that the environment was safer than what it actually was. And the employees were arguing, these workers were arguing that this had harmed them because they were not able to make a honest decision as to whether they should even be working there. The court denied their lawsuit, said that the EPA, the EPA statements should not have had any effect on the worker's decision, that that was a personal decision and that by working at the trade center, destruct the trade center destruction, they were exposing themselves to dangerous chemicals and it really was at their own risk. The, um, the second one, the Esteval, I think I'm saying that right, versus Chevron was interesting from this standpoint. There is a, there is a federal law now called the ADA, the American Disabilities Act. And what the ADA was passed for is to prevent discrimination of handicapped individuals. And that the ADA mark monitors that um, if there are situations on the work site that could cause a disability that the ADA would fine the owners and, um, and subject them to these fines. Where 
Well, Mr. Estabal wanted to work at a particular plant owned by Chevron. And the argument of the court was very interesting. The court said the ADA protects all individuals from being harmed, but the statute does not protect individuals if they accept the risk of working in a harmful environment, similar to the Lombardi case, that because he elected to work voluntarily in a area where he would be exposed to dangerous chemicals, that there was no liability on Chevron's part regarding his employment. And so again, the argument is you accept the risk of some of these high risk jobs. Now the Chow versus OSHA case takes a little explanation. OSHA is the Occupational and Safety Health Administration. And this is a federal law that was passed many years ago to prevent injury to workers on the job that OSHA inspects certain work sites as to whether the work site is safe and that there are no danger that employees can be injured. And the, the interesting argument that was made was the owner of this Mr. Chow had had built a building with many safety violations. And it really was a, a, there were many, he had been cited repeatedly for the, uh, the safety violations that he um, had on the property. Some of the, his employees were killed in a explosion of a, of a gas line and of course, the, um, the employee sued and the, um, the, the issue really came down to OSHA was, was enforcing some of the, the violations and not others. And the court held that OSHA was within its jurisdiction to use its own judgment as to which violations Mr. Chow should be, penal should be penalized for. The Kasky versus Nike case is in there really for the situation. Mr. Katsky was an activist and he had sued Nike and uh, the basis of his lawsuit was Nike was committing fraud in running advertising that they complied with all employment laws within the states where their sneakers were built or being um, constructed. Well, it turns out, and we're all familiar with this, Nike was running sweatshops in these underdeveloped countries and the plaintiff was alleging, well, this was false advertising that because they were advertising that they followed the rules, weren't they committing fraud? And the court had an interesting holding. It said it was really nothing. There was no liability on Nike's part. They were merely trying to put on a good face and that their advertising really had no effect on whether they were running these sweatshops. And so the case was dismissed and, um, and Nike was not liable for um, false advertising. Now, the Madeira versus Affordable Housing Foundation has an interesting basis. Uh, Mr. Madeira was an undocumented worker. He was one of the many illegal aliens, the millions that are currently in the United States 
and many of them are working. And Mr. Madeira was injured on a project of the Affordable Housing Foundation. And of course, he collected from workers' comp in the state, which workers' comp is the state-run fund that gives workers who are injured on the job benefits because of the injuries. And the defendants, Affordable Housing Foundation, had an interesting argument that they made to the court. And their argument was that because Mr. Madeira was an illegal alien, that the federal law involving immigration should preempt the state workers' comp law. And preemption means that it's the doctrine that if state law conflicts with federal law, the federal law prevails. And the court said no, that Mr. Madeiras sh should be able to recover under the workers' comp law, whether he was an illegal alien or not, and that he was afforded the benefits of the, um, the state workers' compensation, compensation laws. Now, Chapter 8, I'm going to condense it and really just cover these two cases. And you notice, unfortunately, Ford Motor Company is involved in both of them. And if you look at the chapter title, Risk Allocation Products Liability, this is the, and, and you've discussed this in the discussion question, and Danny versus Ford is your um, assignment, written assignment for this week. And let's do a little his, historical background to um, what we're talking about here. For many years, the law was that if you were injured by a defendant, the injury was called a tort. And this area of the law was called tort law. And the case law developed that if you as the plaintiff were injured by the defendant, you had to prove that the defendant was negligent. And in addition to that, that his negligence was a direct cause of your injury and that he also owed, he owed you a duty and that he had breached that duty by in some form that caused your injury. Well, as the law developed, it became evident that this was a major hurdle for individuals who had been injured by a large manufacturer. And the law eventually converted to what was what is known as breach of warranty or strict liability. And this concept in the law of strict liability which is also known as products liability, says that the major manufacturers, the large companies like Ford, like Walmart, like all of these major companies, they have the means to compensate people and that the, the risk is being allocated is what's going on here. And so under risk allocation, if you were injured by a product manufactured by Ford and you can pre prove that there was a defect in the product and that you were damaged by that defect, you recover from Ford. And Ford, you don't have to prove negligence. You don't co have to go through the steps to prove that. Ford, because they're a large company and they're sending these products out, obviously an automobile is a dangerous product. And so they're liable if a defect causes the injury. Now the Denny case involved the manufacture by Ford of a Bronco too. And I believe the Bronco is also famous as the getaway car for the um, the football player 
and the whose name uh, eludes me at the minute at the moment, but the um, the famous case, and of course he was escaping in his Ford Bronco. Now the the court in the factual situation states that Ford knew that the Bronco was really for off-road use, that it had a high center of gravity, that it was a it, that it could tend to overturn, and that it should not be used as a passenger vehicle. That the plaintiff, Mrs. Denny, even had testimony from one of Ford's engineers that stated that that Ford was aware that the the Bronco should only be sold as an off-road vehicle and not as a passenger vehicle. Well, unfortunately, the Ford Marketing Department ignored its own engineer's warnings and advertised the Bronco as a family vehicle that mom could run the kids to school and to their activities and that she and the children would be perfectly safe in the uh, city in their Ford Bronco. Well, Ms. Denny, who had bought a Ford Bronco, was driving down the highway and a deer ran out in front of her. And she put on the brakes and to avoid hitting the deer, the Bronco rolled over. She and the ch children in the car were seriously injured and they sued Ford based on products liability that Ford had manufactured a defective product. And the interesting thing about the Denny case is the defect was in the design of the product, where we normally think of a defect being something breaking mechanically. And Ms. Denny was able to recover damages from Ford because the defect involved a design flaw and in the marketing of the vehicle by Ford. Now, the last case that I want to discuss, and it really is from the standpoint of uh, an interesting concept in the law. And in tort law, the law has a concept called punitive damages. And punitive damages are awarded to a plaintiff when it's shown that the defendant's conduct was so outrageous and so without any, any kind of consideration to injuries that could be caused that the court is going to punish the defendant and award a large award of punitive damages and it can run in the millions. And the Grimshaw case is based on the Ford Pinto, which probably none of you have ever heard of, but the Ford Pinto was built in 1972. And it was part of a strategy of Ford to build an inexpensive sedan for the general public something that would be affordable. And you'll have, you, I'm sure will laugh when you heard, when you hear that the Pinto cost $2,000, a complete automobile for $2,000. The problem was Ford had tried to save a little money in the design of the Pinto. And the problem was Ford had left the gas tank right next to the rear bumper. And there had even been incidents and in Ford's testing where if the Pinto was rear-ended by another vehicle, the gas tank exploded and would cause a fire and injuring the occupants. And guess what? Ms. Grimshaw and her son were rear-ended 
The car burst into flames. Ms. Grimshaw was killed in the fire and her son was seriously disfigured. And in addition to the damages Ms. Grimshaw recovered from Ford, Ford was assessed punitive damages because the court found that their conduct was outrageous and that the injury they caused, that there was no reason for them to design the car causing this kind of danger. And that concludes our week three meeting.